it high reindeer Kawak sea lion is so seal Chokich halibut Atheda codfish Hanuk red salmon Chavichach king salmon Angsus berries Alugach the root of a chocolate lily We have relied upon a diet from the land and sea for thousands of years. Today our diet is changing. What do we really know about the risks and benefits of our changing diet? And how can we make healthy choices about traditional and store-bought foods? To answer these questions, the Aleutian Pribilof Islands Association, in conjunction with ATCA IRA and the Tribal Government of St. Paul, is performing a four-year study on how changes in the environment and in diet are affecting the health of the people in our rural villages. The diet of the residents of the communities in the study is more than just the sum of their nutritional intake. It really is um, a look into the culture and traditions of the community and the uh, methods by which they've uh, survived for thousands of years. And diet, really the gathering, the harvesting of traditional subsistence species, the, uh, the preparation, the sharing, the consumption, that forms the, the touchstone of the culture of these communities. And that is as integral a part of their health as their nutrient intake. And I think this study really puts those two things together in a way that has not been done before. Eleven hundred miles from Anchorage, in the middle of the Aleutian chain, lies the village of Atka. Because of its remoteness and its natural abundance, Atka continues to rely more heavily on traditional foods than any other village in the Aleutian chain. Welcome to Atka, Alaska. We're uh, in the middle of the Aleutian Islands. Um, honest to goodness God country. I'm Sally Svetsov. And this is my daughter, Crystal Svetsov. Right now, we're looking for moss berries. There's about a hundred people here. Everybody that lives here lives off of subsistence. We have, we have a, our store, and uh, from that we, we, we get some stuff, but it's mostly the main foods as far as meats and fish go, we eat subsistence. But the store is there for your other essentials, you know, for your flour, sugar, rice. But there's moss bears around still. Although it's October, uh, they're still there. That's all that's left right now before winter sets in. We have all kind of fish. We have red salmon, dog salmon, silver salmon, king salmon, pink salmon, trout, we have reindeer, we have seal, sea lion, uh, halibut, a lot of halibut, cod, and then there's other rockfish that we eat. So we have plenty of, plenty of food source here as far as meat and fish goes. Diabetes and high blood pressure and all that is a is a concern uh, because of our diet change. I mean, we have nowadays uh, more more junk food available to us because of lack of exercise and more more soda pop and sweets available. It changes the way how things used to be. In the communities of St. Paul and Atka, 
it will be important to look at prevalence rates of diseases that are related to a diet and diet change like diabetes and obesity and um, to a lesser extent hypertension and I think that information combined with some of the historical data about the prevalence of these conditions in Alaska Natives in times past may be pretty useful to the community in assessing what changes in diet and activity and lifestyle have caused in their own community's health. Many of the things that are um, big problems of morbidity and mortality among Alaska Natives now are related to diet. And uh, it's our belief that the traditional diet has a lot to offer in the way of reversing these things. Diet has traditionally connected rural communities throughout Alaska. It is a common link to the land and culture. However, each community is unique with different environment, lifestyles, and diet. This study will focus on four main questions. How can we compare the risks posed by contaminants with the many benefits of a traditional diet? How can we weigh the risks posed by a store-bought diet? How can villages get the information they need to make informed dietary decisions? And what kind of process can we use to evaluate our diet on a local level? The community of St. Paul in the Pribilof Islands is located in the Bering Sea, 750 miles from Anchorage. For as long as the Pribilovians have inhabited these islands, the culture, the lifestyle, and the diet have been shaped by one overwhelming force, the annual migration of thousands of northern fur seal to their summer breeding grounds. I'm Aqualina. Debbie Lestenkoff, and I grew up on St. Paul Island. I work with the Tribal Government of St. Paul and their Ecosystem Conservation Office as a co-director. I think by the end of this four-year project that we're working on, risks and benefits of eating traditional foods, we will find contaminants in traditional foods how much or how little I don't think is going to really be important in as much as where the contaminants are located within the animal, whether it's in the brain, whether it's in the bones, whether it's in the kidney, uh, we're, we're going to be finding them in places and having to make decisions based on where we found them. But I'm hoping that along the way we will also pull in all these other strings that are attached to this project. I think our biggest concern right now is uh, not having seal to eat, that there's, they're in a decline. It's actually kind of sad though uh, for some people who haven't been here and who come here briefly. They may look at this and, and think, oh my goodness, I've never seen so many animals in one place at one time. But if you're someone that's here and you know what it looked like, 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago and you look at it now, there really are so few. And not only at this particular rookery, but uh, uh, overall the northern fur seal population is down. The whole issue around community traditional food safety is related to the transport of mostly man-made persistent organic contaminants from the lower latitudes where they're produced and used to the far north where they get deposited and stay for extended periods of time. They make their way into the food chain and uh, as they progress up the food chain they become more concentrated and uh, when they're consumed by the highest level predators, seals, gulls, polar bears, walruses, at that level they're often consumed by humans. And so the concern 
is, are these compounds making our traditional foods unsafe to eat? When we've increased fisheries around the Pribilof Islands, we increased the human interaction with the Bering Sea, increased garbage in the ocean, increased potential, and increased uh, oil spills, etc. And people really are wondering, is this like, they're, and where they live now is not clean, and maybe I should be eating it. So you had people that stopped eating before everybody threw everything. Everybody threw their probably used oil in their garbage can to be taken out to the landfill, their batteries, their aluminums. I don't know that it would directly, immediately impact fur seals, but if we have anything toxic that is leaching into the land below, it's going to probably do one or two things. It's going to go out in the ocean, which is not good because then we have a seal swimming around, or it's going to go into our water lens under the island, which is our drinking source. And so there are monitoring wells watching the present landfill. And uh, we also are right at a point where the landfill that we're presently using is to be closed and a new one developed and we need to take advantage of this opportunity to introduce new concepts of how we deal with our garbage. Seal probably at this point is not a primary food source to people here. We have a lot of young people eating modern foods, uh, foods from the stores. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean we don't put any effort into finding out more about the seal as a food source and whether it's important, what are the benefits and what are the risks. It's because we don't know if we end up one day needing to really depend on the seal to be our food full time again, like it was in the past. I think we need to, we owe it to uh, humankind to, to, to know the value of those foods and not so much that they're traditional in as much as it is promoting eating from where you live. If I eat seal, I'm not expecting a farm somewhere in the Midwestern states to provide beef for me. What is, how is beef impacting that particular environment by being provided for me way up here in Alaska? What are those risks and benefits? The other thing is physical impact uh, in regards to when I eat seal, what does it have that makes me better able to live in this environment that is very windy, that is um, very wet and damp a lot of the times? And when I eat seal, what properties does it have that um, help me to, to be able to exist in it wholeheartedly versus if I ate uh, a meat or a vegetable for some other place. I have a faith in humankind where if we know things, if we're very aware of things, we make better decisions. But I think we would see a large amount of people that would step forward and, and uh, make responsible decisions if they had those facts in front of them. I think by the end of uh, this four-year project, we'll be able to uh, give information to people that uh, partake of both traditional foods versus eating uh, your, your store-bought foods to better make better decisions or how can they balance them? How can they balance both and still feel like they're making decisions regarding their own immediate health?